I left y'all hanging at the church when we read the song, Hold the Fort, and I'm sure probably most of you said, okay, good song, why don't he tell us that story, what does it have to do with Sardis Baptist Church? Mr. Sherman and several of his troops came through the camp. Some came right down this road here, some came down and came through, and, and they all met up at Gil. Now, everybody in front of you, there ought to be a songbook. Get you one of these songbooks out. It's called the Church Hymn. After the Battle of Chickamauga, the Yankees retreated back to Chattanooga. They were boxed in Chattanooga, only had one way to get supplies in, and that was coming from the Tennessee River. They finally broke out in 64. And they had the Battle of Resaca, and as most of you know, that care to know, they went all the way to Atlanta. Well, then they started chasing John Bell Hood, and they chased him all the way back to Dalton. Before they got to Dalton, there's a lake down there called Lake Altoona. At the time during the Civil War, there was no Lake Altoona. It was called Altoona Pass. The Confederates had the Yankees. They were about to take, they were about to take Altoona Pass. And the flag corps was flagging General Sherman and his troops down at Kennesaw. High on the rocks, high on the rocks. The name of this song is called, and I'm not going to sing it. The name of this song is called Hold the Fort. And there is no glasses up here. We're in trouble. Uh, it says, hold my comrades. See the signal? We talked about the signal. See the signal waving to the, in the sky? Reinforcements now appearing. Victory is now. See the mighty host advancing. Satan leading on. Mighty men around us follow. Courageous almost. Courage almost gone. See the glorious banner waving. Hear the trumpet blow. In our leader's name we will trumpet over every foe. Fierce and long the battle rages, but our help is near. Onward comes great our commander. Cheer, my comrades, cheer. They had signaled Sherman. Sherman said, hold the fort, we're coming. Sherman never showed up, but they held the fort. They had a fort down there. And that song, you look it up, everybody's got it. Everybody's got cell phones, everybody's got Google. Google it. Google Hold the Fort, that's a Civil War song about Sherman holding the troops. I was fortunate enough to meditate right down the road and we found some stuff proving that the troops were here. We found Civil War bullets right off the hill right here. We fired, found fired musket balls right off the hill. Right down the road, the gentleman that was our deacon here had some property. We have found stuff from the 1830s, Civil War stuff. We've even found some World War I stuff. But the troops were there, and the troops came right through here. They split up and divided the county up, and they covered. They say at one time there was between 90 and 100,000 troops, and they all gathered up in Gilsley before Sherman's march to the sea. Some of those same troops came through here. Some of those same troops came right by Sardis Baptist Church. I personally have two letters handwritten by a man who was from Illinois. He was in the 50th Regiment of Illinois. And he wrote letters to his parents. He wrote one from Chattanooga. He wrote one from Cedar Bluff. And he wrote one from Galesville. I actually have the letters from Chattanooga. I have the letters from Cedar Bluff. He told his parents they had marched 417 miles in 30 days. They had came from Atlanta all the way back to Dalton, over to Lafayette, come all the way down what we know as Highway 27 now, and they came by Sardis Church. They were in Gilsland, stayed seven to 10 days. They wind up back in Chattanooga, 417 miles in 30 days. Now, I know we could drive that in a few hours in our car, but imagine having to walk 417 miles and you only got 30 days. And they laid up for a week in Gilsland. Welcome to the Charles Price home. And what you see is left of it. Guys, if you gather around, you can see some bricks in the rubble there. At one time, there was a huge mansion here. Huge mansion. Those bricks that you see were made on this property. They were made on the property. 
probably hauled the dirt and stuff off of the mountain and they were cooked and baked and put up here. In this house, there was over a hundred thousand bricks in this house. In 1832, they had ran the uh, Indians off from the properties and they started giving land lotteries away in 160 acres sections. Gentleman from South Carolina, Franklin, South Carolina, Ely was his last name, I-L-E-Y. Mr. Ely actually drew the lottery and won the lottery for this section of property. In May the 25th of uh, 1832, they surveyed this property. This property was surveyed and documented. And there's people that think that this house that was here, they think that this house was here, was in here in the 1700s. Well, if it was surveyed in 1832, it would have showed up. A house as big as this house is, now, a house this big is going to show up. Somebody's going to stumble across it. And in 1832, when they surveyed the property, it showed no, it showed no signs of a house. The surveyor's plat showed no sign of a house. So that does away with the theory of it being here when they surveyed the land in the 1700s. The house was not built. Now, we asked a question earlier. What was the man's name that gave the land to the church? James Price. Very good. Mr. James Price. Mr. James Price had a brother. His name was Charles Jr. Charles Jr. built this house. Charles and James were brothers. James owned 1,800 acres down there. Mr. Price bought this land. Remember, Mr. Ely won it in a lottery in 1832. Four years later, Mr. Price bought the property for Mr. Ely for $805. That's 160 acres, guys, for $805. I'm going to guess there was no house here in 1836 because if, or if it had been, it had been a lot more than that because that's a big house. That's a big house. One, they say when it was built, it was one of the finer homes in North Georgia, especially Northwest Georgia, one of the finer homes. So, Mr. Ailey sold the property. All right, Mr. Uh, Price, who bought the house, built the house, probably used slave labor, built the house, 100,000 bricks go into the home. It had three chimneys, six fireplaces in the home. Pretty big place. Well, Mr. Price was also a house representative in 1843. You can check that for yourself. Mr. Price dies in 1855. Mr. Price's wife is left to raise seven kids. They all had big families then. So, two years later, Charles's wife, Mary, she passes away. Who's going to raise these seven kids? Mary had a sister. Her husband, which had died, was a minister. She was left out here in the middle of nowhere to raise seven kids in a huge house. Two of the kids, one of them's name was after his dad. He was named Charles D. Charles D winds up, he dies in Vicksburg. They had that out there in uh, July of 63. Actually on the same day as uh, Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. Had another son, Joseph. He died at the Battle of uh, the Wilderness. Two of the sons were gone. Guys, we can't see it here because it has, it has grown up. But across the road, and we'll see it as we go back out in this open field here across the road, you'll see a clump of trees, and there's some huge pine trees that grow up there. There's a cemetery there. Some folks call it the Charles Price Cemetery. Some folks call it the Tiggs Cemetery because the Tiggs live right down here. There's two sets of Tiggs that live down here. Tiggs. And some folks refer to it as the Tiggs Cemetery. We won't be visiting that site today. It's a little grown up. And once you get inside there, a lot of the stones are turned over. They go way back. Some of the kids that lived here married and are buried out there. Some of the Price family is buried down there. Those Prices give the property to the church. This was a brother to the same guy. They were very, very prominent folks, but like everybody, they had to die. Now, I can remember when the house stood, and I can remember an older man, an older man living in it. This man walked everywhere he went. He lived at the foot of Dirt Cellar Mountain, and some of the time he stayed up here. He stayed on the bottom floor. 
He was what they call an herbalist. Does anybody know what an herbalist is? Tell us what it is, our doorman. A person who makes uh, different remedies or concoctions out of herbs they find. Very good. Very good. Mr. Doorman didn't actually get to find out his name, but he's, he's our doorman. He would go to the woods and people would come to him and give him money. That's how he made money. They would give him money. They needed, they needed this herb, they needed that herb, or they needed something. They'd tell him what the problem is and he'd go get it. My dad would send me to the woods and when our horse or our mule, my dad plowed with the mule, when the mule would get sick, he'd send me to the woods and I had been with him enough to know what it looked like and we'd get something that was called rat's vein. It was it was just a it was just a leaf leaf that grew in the ground. It was just you know just a herb, and we would take that rat's vein and he would bake it in the oven and he'd crumble it up and whatever was in it when he crumbled it up and put it in that mule's feed, the mule would eat it and the mule would get better. So I have no reservations about Mr. Elmer Elmer Eller, the herbalist. I saw him live here. I know he's here. If you went to school in Larley. In the 1940s and 50s, maybe even in the 60s, there was two elderly women that lived in this home. They lived there full time. Nice home. They lived there. Sometime during the year, the fifth grade teacher would let you hike from the Larley School to here. Now y'all all went by Larley School. Y'all saw it on the bus, right? And it's not that far. It's just a little over a mile. And they would tell old stories. They would tell stories about their ancestors that lived here and the people that lived here before them. And one story was, um, y'all still got that picture floating. You can't tell it from the front, but on the house, on the ends of the house, you can't see it maybe, but there were false windows up on top. They weren't real windows. They're filled in by brick. But if you rode by, man, that's pretty nice. But they were false windows. There was not actually a window there, but if you rode by, it looked like there was a window there. But they could look out of the front of the house, and one of the old stories is, legend, is they could look out the house, and they could see the soldiers camped along the creek. They could see their little campfires camped along the creek. They, they were camped along the creek. The creek was just right down the road here. Run, it runs the property here and runs back around, and it winds up back in Lyrely. That's called Mostella Creek. And the ladies told that their older family members remembered seeing soldiers camped along camped along the creek side and i thought that's just like an old urban legend that probably is not really true but it it helped it helped add a little bit of credence with the house okay we'll buy into it they camped there they saw them. then about 35 years ago, maybe 40 now, I'm trying to think of how old I am. Not that, not that far back. Several years ago, just right on the other side of the creek, and there's a road that runs to the left, we call it Smallin Road, and people locals call it Possum Trot. Some friends of mine build a house over there. They build a house, they dug the foundation, and um, they had to move dirt out of the way, so they had a pile of dirt over here. Well, they're building a house and this pile of dirt's over here. Well, of course, it's going to rain. You're building a house just like cutting hay, it's going to rain. So, sometime later, the husband comes out one morning and he sees something shining there in that pile of dirt. Well, he goes over there and picks this up, whatever it is, and it's shining. And it's made out of silver. It's real silver. It's not sterling silver, it's real silver. And engraved on this matchbox, it was a silver matchbox, and engraved on it, was the soldier's name, his infantry, what company he was in, and what corps he was in. It was a Union soldier's matchbox. I said, okay, I guess it's not urban legend. I guess the old ladies could see people camped along the campfire, so that made me believe that.